Hello and welcome to day two of the Energy Action Days of the High Level Dialogue for Energy. I'm Nisha Pillay and it's my pleasure to be my, your moderator again today as we count down to the High Level Dialogue on Energy tomorrow, the 24th of September. What a day we had yesterday. I think there were many hundreds of people joining us, not just on this platform, but also on the UN TV channel. And we have over 1,500 people registered with us right now. Would you mind if I shared with you some of the highlights from yesterday as they struck me? I was particularly impressed by that call from the UN Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed to make sure that we have justice and equity in the heart of the energy transition. That's what SDG 7 is all about, after all, making sure that no one is left out when, as we move into the clean energy revolution. We heard from very many energy compacts, uh, governments and NGOs and businesses coming together to do some of the heavy lifting to help us get there. Here are just a few that I found particularly memorable. There was one about gender and energy. I never really thought about that before, bringing together the Icelandic government and UN women. Many different private sector companies pledged to do their bit to try and get electricity to remote rural communities and small island states in many parts of Africa and Asia, not yet connected. And I was counting, some of the pledges went well over a, a hundred million. So we are slowly getting there step by step. And uh, yes, another very bold pledge I was struck by was from the Glee Green Climate Fund that said SDG 7 is achievable. SDG 7, meaning that 800 million people currently without electricity, over 3 billion people without access to clean cooking fuels will be part of the modern energy world by 2030. I think though, looking back on yesterday, the most passionate voice of all for me came from a young woman in Khartoum. Do you remember her? Nasreen Al Saim, the UN Secretary General's Youth Advisory Group Advisor on Climate Change. And she said to us that we have to speed up our urgency. We have to bring in the timelines. Otherwise, her country, Sudan, well, it may no longer be here as she knows it in 2050. Well, that made me sit up and listen. And so therefore, we thought today we're going to plunge into our agenda with another young voice going over to Bolivia to join Paula Flores Carvajal from the Global Youth Energy Outlook at Student Energy. And she wants to hear some big, bold promises from the leaders at the High Level Dialogue tomorrow. My name is Paola Flores. I'm from Bolivia and I'm part of the Global Youth Energy Outlook at Student Energy. Living in the rural areas of my country made me understand how important is electricity access for indigenous communities because it means to access a better education, to access a well-structured health services, and it is a right because it means giving a better quality of life to people. Now we need world leaders to increase electricity access, but also to secure communities with affordable energy, because energy poverty is not only not having access to electricity, but not having the resources to pay for it. So we need electricity access projects developed by and with communities and world leaders in governance spaces. <music> Paola from Bolivia, that's not just about access, it's about affordable access to energy. And now for our opening remarks, I'm going to hand over to Damilola Ogunbui, the CEO and Special Representative of the UN Secretary General for Sustainable Energy for All and co-chair of UN Energy. And she joins us live now from the UN studios in New York City. Damilola. Thank you so much, Anisha, and thank you for your roundup of yesterday. So yesterday, we began to shine the light on some energy compacts, showcasing bold ambition and commitments that are designed to accelerate action on the clean energy transition, as well as ending energy poverty. The diversity in the commitment showcases how we all have to work together and why this process must be inclusive. Today, 
we're going to hear about more energy compacts from world leaders once again demonstrating what leadership looks like and making the case for more of you to please join us on our nine year journey towards achieving SDG 7 and also towards achieving net zero by 2050. We need to move beyond just high level targets and focus on the actions that will help us deliver on all our common goals. So thank you all for joining us today and look forward to speaking to you later. Thank you so much, Dami Lola, and thank you for guiding us through this whole process into the high-level dialogue for energy tomorrow. We now have a very special guest indeed joining us from the US. Samantha Power is the administrator of US Aid, the world's premier international development agency. She and her staff of over 10,000 people are currently focused on at least four interrelated challenges, the COVID-19 pandemic, of course, the development gains that it has jeopardized, climate change, and very many humanitarian crises that continue to bubble along. Energy access for all, where does that sit in her inbox? Well, let's find out now and cross over and join live Samantha Power. A big warm welcome. Thank you so much and uh, and good morning everyone or good afternoon or good evening wherever uh, you find yourself. Uh, I would like to start by thanking Special Representative Ogun B and Secretary General Guterres for convening this important forum today. As you know, this is the first General Assembly dialogue to focus on energy in more than 40 years. This itself is a remarkable, and I think if we're honest, a quite unfortunate fact. To say that this gathering is overdue is not to do it justice, but it is a tribute to those who have organized it. If we are serious about ending poverty, then we need to end energy poverty to unlock the productivity that fuels economic growth. If we're serious, as we say we are, about expanding opportunity for women and girls, and giving rural women in poor countries options beyond manual labor like milling grain and gathering firewood, then we need to expand access to electricity so they can enter the formal economy. If we want children to study without having to gather under street lights, if we want COVID-19 vaccines to stay cold on their way from ports to remote villages, and if we want countries to prosper while fighting climate change at the same time, then we need to provide reliable, affordable, clean energy to the nearly 760 million people whose day ends at nightfall, 75% of whom are in Sub-Saharan Africa. Since 2013, the United States' Power Africa initiative has worked with partner countries to bring electricity to more than 118 million people across the continent, taking advantage of revolutions in technologies like off-grid solar and wind run of river hydropower and improve battery storage to help renewable energy solutions reach last mile communities. In areas where these interventions have occurred, parents no longer have to worry that the smoke from kerosene lanterns might suffocate their children while they stay up reading. Farmers and fishermen won't lose the majority of their harvests or catches because they have no way to refrigerate their goods before they spoil. And health clinics in these communities where Power Africa has made progress Health clinics in Africa, one in four of which do not have access to electricity, are able to keep the lights on to treat patients and help deliver children. Because medical emergencies don't wait for sunrise or diesel generators to be refueled. Tomorrow, I'm pleased to say, Secretary Kerry will unveil the Biden administration's plan to partner with countries in Africa and elsewhere to transition their economies to clean energy and to take advantage of new renewable technologies that undeniably demonstrate that societies can grow and go green at the same time. As renewable energy gets cheaper, batteries grow more effective and the gains of electrification become clearer, the world can do both. In fact, we know we must. And I hope this gathering becomes an inflection point in recognizing just how urgent clean electrification is in the lives of those who do not have power. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Samantha Power. You put it so very clearly to us. If we are serious about ending poverty, then we have to end energy poverty, a slogan to carry us through today. 
Samantha Power there, Vice President um, from the USAID, of course, Administrator of USAID. And now I'm going to introduce you to the Vice President for Infrastructure at the World Bank, Ricardo Politi. He has recently stepped into these shoes. Where does climate infrastructure state in stand amongst his very many priorities in his full inbox? Over to you, Mr. Politi. Uh, good morning, Misha. Good morning, everybody. Distin uh, excellencies, distinguished guests. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I see everybody is calling from different parts of, of the world. Let's take a moment today to celebrate the great progress made to advance renewable energies that are accelerating the clean, affordable, inclusive energy transition. Over the past decade, renewable energy and battery storage innovations have expanded and improved access to electricity, connecting millions of poor and remote households. At the same time, new technologies like offshore wind, blue and green hydrogen, as well as carbon capture and storage are promising new decarbonization opportunities that can drive the sustainable energy access for all. While these innovations are promising, much more needs to be done to radically transform the way we produce and consume energy, to drastically reduce emissions while at the same time meeting development, developing countries' growing energy demand with clean, sustainable, inclusive and affordable energy. So how do we meet this growing demand for energy access while cutting down on emissions? The answer is a sweet, well-managed retirement of coal and other high emissions power plants and a massive scale up in renewable energy and energy efficiency. The energy transition requires an immediate focus on deploying existing low-cost technologies in the power sector that power transportation, buildings and industry with clean electricity. Solar and wind energy must increase to four times the record set in 2020 to replace fossil fuel-based energy, to achieve universal access to energy and to meet growing demand for electricity. And this must be done in a way that is just for all, protecting the lively livelihoods of communities that face the costs of transition away from coal. So how do we get there? We need three key ingredients clear political commitment to energy transition targets, supportive policy frameworks and financing. Governments need to establish energy transition targets with credible implementation plans and halt further investments in new coal fired power plants while retiring and repurposing coal assets. Scaling up the deployment of, of renewable energy requires a scaling up of financing commensurate to the size of the challenge. Global investment must rise from an average of one trillion annually over the last five years to an average of almost two trillion annually, and then double that towards the end of the decade. $35 billion must be mobilized for electricity access and $25 billion for clean cooking annually. The World Bank Group is working hand in hand with countries to accelerate this transition to a more affordable, cleaner and inclusive energy. We are supporting investments in energy efficiency, renewable energy and both grid and off-grid energy access with data-driven planning, project preparation, institutional strengthening, improvement of utility performance and energy subsidy reforms. We are also scaling up our investments in clean cooking. The World Bank committed $8.4 billion in clean energy investments, including renewable energy access in the past five years. And we plan to increase that enormously. Developing countries require an unprecedented volume of financing to transform their energy sector at an unprecedented speed and scale in the coming decades. <clears throat> we will do our share, catalyzing change at scale to achieve ambitions and joining forces with development partners to achieve impact by mobilizing and deploying capital commensurate with this challenge. The compact the World Bank will present is presenting to the UN commits to support to providing 100 million people with access to clean cooking and up to 60 million people with access to electricity between now and 2025. With that, I conclude and I thank all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Ricardo Politi.
from the World Bank, giving us a comprehensive overview there of how the World Bank intends to ramp up its investment in infrastructure projects to deliver renewable energy at scale over the next nine years. And I'm glad to hear that uh, he also mentioned clean cooking and the need to put considerably more effort into that area too. Now, with great pleasure, let me introduce you to our next speaker, Her Excellency Inga Anderson, Under Secretary General of the United Nations and Executive Director of the UN Environment Programme, UNEP. How does she see SDG 7 in the context of the other global goals and the road to COP26? Over the, to you, Your Excellency. Thank you so much. And I send you all greetings from beautiful Nairobi where the United Nations Environment Programme are proud to be headquartered. So when it comes to energy, I think we all face what seems like a uh, dilemma. On the one hand, climate change is hitting harder every year. This year, we saw the strong warning from the IPCC. And we saw impacts on floods and wildfires and droughts. Many, perhaps for the first time, realize that no one is safe. The updated climate promises under the Paris Agreement aren't good enough, uh, we know now, uh, to prevent dangerous warming that will bring more disruption. So to get back on track to 1.5, that goal that we set, uh, emissions from this sector need to be halved by 2030 and eliminated by 2050. But on the other hand, we need to address energy poverty. As we just heard, despite significant progress, an estimated 660 million people still at, lack access to electricity in 2030, most of them in sub-Saharan Africa. So to provide energy equity and connectivity and access for all, we have to rapidly expand the energy access. And that would mean more greenhouse gas emissions and more pain if we follow the current energy models. But in truth, this is not a dilemma. We can expand access to energy. We can cut emissions at the same time, if we accelerate a tra transition to clean, efficient, and affordable energy. UNEP, my organization's emissions gap research, has shown that the energy sector can cut 12.5 gigatons off it annual, its annual emissions, about a quarter of the total global emissions. And the benefits from the energy transition do, do not stop at climate change. Investing in the energy transition would create three times more jobs than similar investments in fossil fuels. To give you one example, building efficiency retrofits and efficient new buildings can create between 10 and 30 jobs per million of dollars spent. This is the most cost efficient job measure in the entire energy sector. And of course, providing clean and efficient energy will reduce air pollution, we just saw WHO out with their new report today and help with the quality education and healthcare, uh, as we heard Ms. Power speak to, as well as many other social benefits. Now, we all know about the role of renewables in this transition. We have to accelerate that development and spread of renewables, including through technology transfer that will help nations meet their conditional um, nationally uh, determined contributions. But we can't place enough emphasis on the need to have an accompanying push on energy efficiency across the board. We need to keep using energy. Uh, we need to stop using energy in that same wasteful way. And we need to demand that we uh, have grids powered by clean energy. Otherwise, we will not be able to cope. Better and more efficient technologies already exist including those nature has put right at our disposal for millennia, such as the natural cooling of greenery and uh, infrastructure, green infrastructure and breezeways and so on. All of this obvious potential is why UNEP places so much focus on clean and efficient energy, working with countries, cities, sectors and communities to enable that energy transition. Our work with partners show that we can achieve what we can achieve if we act in a comprehensive and integrated way. We support solutions that act across sectors, innovative technologies, policy and finance tool that bring nature into the equation many times. There are many examples of this transformative work. 
with UNEP's support, Rwanda, for example, has started to implement a national plan on sustainable cooling. Ghana has launched a financial mechanism that supports ordinary citizens to purchase highly efficient cooling products. We are creating roadmaps for the decarbonization of energy in buildings and construction, including through green procurement, passive design, natural cooling solutions like green roofs and deep retrofits. So excellencies and friends, the launch of this dialogue on energy compacts gives us a chance to rally around the solutions and accelerate actions for transformational opportunities. And I call on everyone to join the Urban Energy Coalition recently launched by UNEP, by Mission Innovation, by the Global Covenant of Mayors and the World Economic Forum and REN21. That coalition will help cities to reduce their energy use through providing practical frameworks and tools. And the Cool Coalition is another great example of an initiative that is making a real difference. This coalition works on sustainable cooling and cold chains, which will cut energy use and expand access to systems that reduce food waste, waste and loss and store life-saving vaccines. There are many more opportunities obviously here on the cooling side. The point is, that we know that what we need to do. We know even how to do it. And the support and collaborative networks that we need are all in place. It's time for words and good intentions to become immediate and meaningful action. We have a duty of care to the planet and to everyone upon it. We must fulfill it by making our energy systems clean, efficient, and affordable. Thank you, and back over to you. Thank you so much, Inga Anderson. That was a great contribution and good to hear what you were saying about the COOL Coalition because it's going to be joining us a little bit later today to tell us about the nuts and bolts of the new energy compact and what it's hoping to deliver. We're going to cross over now to Nigeria, which has been a, a leading voice amongst developing countries to make sure that we have a just transition at the heart of the energy transition and the climate agenda. Nigeria has developed its uh, energy transition plan in a way which is both ambitious, but also quite challenging and is going to be difficult to implement. So let's find out more now from the Minister of State for Nigeria for the Environment, the Honorable Sharon Ikeaza. Thank you very much, Nisha. Good morning, everyone. Your Excellencies, uh, distinguished participants. It's an absolute pleasure for me to speak with you all today and give those keynote uh, remarks and to also preview Nigeria's uh, energy compact. Let me begin by reaffirming Nigeria's commitment to a just and equitable transition in our role as a global theme champion for the theme on energy transition. We are all at a critical uh, point for the global energy sector, as we now have less than 10 years to go until the SDG 7 deadline. And we remain off track for achieving universal access by 2030. This should be viewed as a global emergency, as without achieving SDG 7 by 2030, we cannot achieve a global energy transition to net zero by 2050. It's imperative then that we take this dialogue as an opportunity to raise ambition towards achieving SDG 7. And I commend UN Energy for leading this bold initiative on energy compacts. I must add, however, that without the financing to execute, our commitments will all mean nothing the Global North must also support with a clean energy offer to help developing nations achieve universal access by 2030. In addition to financing, another key success factor for a just transition is global political alignment on the role of gas. Nigeria has recently developed its energy transition plan which has shown that without a full electrification of our economy across sectors, we cannot achieve net zero by 2050. Gas will have to play a key role before being phased out, as it will help scale up our generation capacity while also giving our grid the flexibility to integrate renewables. 
This energy transition plan also highlighted that we will need to spend $400 billion above business as usual over the next 30 years to reach this net zero target. Further stressing the need to have a clean energy offer on the table. Your Excellencies, distinguished uh, participants, I would like to now give a preview of Nigeria's energy compact commitments. First and foremost, Nigeria has committed to electrifying 5 million households and 25 million people by 2030 using decentralized renewable energy in the form of various uh, solar technologies. It's expected that this program will create 250,000 jobs and kick off Nigeria's efforts to close its energy access deficit by 2030. Implementation of this program is already ongoing. However, total private sector investment of up to 630 million is required to support these um, efforts. Nigeria has also committed to a national gas expansion program, which cuts across areas such as residential clean cooking, captive power generation, automobile conversion, textile production, cold storage, and agro processing. Each of these individual focus areas have specific targets with 2027 20, deadlines. And the intention is to scale up operations using natural gas to give access as a transition fuel on the way to full electrification. Some of the targets under these ambitions include impacting up to 30 million homes with residential clean cooking and creating up to 6,000 jobs and impacting up to 1,200 farmers by energizing agriculture. Finally, through our national decarbonization plan, Nigeria also committed to removing 50% of the Nigerian urban residential sector of the national grid to complete renewable energy power in their homes. 100% clean energy utilization for backup power generation in government buildings, and also systematically transitioning the transport sector to be electric powered. These commitments all have 2050 targets. However, the work will begin in this decade of action and be scaled up over time. Let me wrap up by reiterating the urgent need for a clean energy offer to follow support and to support developing nations in achieving our bold ambitions for access, as without achieving SDG 7 by 2030, we will not achieve a global energy transition to net zero by 2050. It's been my pleasure to speak with you all today, and I look forward to the rest of the dialogue and subsequent outcomes of this dialogue. Thank you all very much. And it's been our pleasure to have you with us, Minister Ike Azor, one of our global champions indeed. And she made a point which some people may not have wanted to hear, but is a point of realism really, that Nigeria is committed to including gas and expanding gas in its uh, energy offering over the next few years in order to make sure that amongst other things, clean cooking facilities are available to all. And now I'm extremely excited to introduce you to our next speaker, a big hitter. He is Achim Steiner, administrator of the UN Development Programme, also co-chair, remember, of the High Level Dialogue on Energy Tomorrow with Damilola Ogunbi. And if anyone can analyze and outline the interlinkages between energy, development, and climate, that person is Achim Steiner. So a big warm welcome to you. Thanks for joining us. Nisha, thank you very much for your kind introduction. And um, I share the excitement that um, you bring to this event today and indeed my fellow panelists, because as we call this event, it is celebrating the strides that we are taking in moving forward. And um, this high level dialogue on energy comes at a moment in time where we are both confronted with extraordinary challenges, but also unprecedented opportunities. And I think that is in a sense why SDG 7 also deserves such attention at this moment in time. Now the IPCC warns us that we are not waiting for the climate crisis to descend upon us. It is already here. 
are now intensifying in every corner of the globe. Nor, as the Secretary General reminded us this week here in New York at the UN General Assembly, we are not on track to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement either, while progress on many of the global goals has also been hit significantly by setbacks due to this pandemic. And yet, and I say this very deliberately, we actually stand on the cusp of a historic tipping point in 2021. We can now, and I would argue have begun already, a clean energy revolution that will radically reshape our energy systems and therefore our economies and our societies. Indeed, it will improve the well-being of millions of people and help to heal our planet as carbon emissions start to fall. At the high-level dialogue, governments and many other players in the field of energy have an opportunity to now make bold and game-changing decisions that will secure that greener, more sustainable future we all talk about and that I know virtually every citizen on the planet would welcome. And standing shoulder to shoulder, the United Nations, as you have already heard from my colleague Inga, and we'll hear from many others, the United Nations will be on hand to support countries and communities at this pivotal moment. Now, this support will build on what I believe are tectonic shifts that are already taking place, and Inga and others before me have spoken to it. There has been a 76% reduction in proposed coal power plants since 2015 Paris Agreement. And, you know, some are rightly going to say that is not enough. But just think back 10 years, and you probably would not have believed that this would really happen. Moreover, the cost of renewable energy is plummeting. Remarkably, it is now cheaper to opt for solar than to build a new coal-fired power plant in almost every country across the globe. But as you also just heard from the Honorable Minister of Nigeria, there is a transition that has to be just, and it has to, in a sense, reflect the realities of every individual country. Clearly, I would argue we are living in the midst of an energy revolution, but it will happen in different ways and in different combinations, and yes, sometimes on different pathways. Yet there is a clear danger that entire countries could be left behind. This is the challenge for any government and any decision maker at this moment. If current trends continue to 2030, over half a billion people, for example, still won't have electricity access. And this is the 21st century. This lack of energy access is simply unacceptable and unnecessary when we have the technology to solve this. Everything from solar powered water pumps to smart energy grids and beyond. Yet strong commitments are the first vital step to help extinguish this stubborn form of inequality. Doing so will bring power to hospitals for the first time and allow schools to open for longer. It will also drive down poverty rates and bring millions of people online in this digital age, opening up an incredible array of new opportunities. That, dear colleagues, is the logic of the SDGs and the 2030 Agenda, within which SDG is firmly embedded. In short, new energy access will bring dignity to millions of people. Now, Two powerful levers can accelerate the energy revolution, and you have already heard about it from the previous speakers. First, we must seize the off-grid electrification opportunity. Distributed renewable energy solutions are a $200 billion investment opportunity that must be seized. These solutions hold the potential to realize universal energy access in Africa and by extension for the first time in human history across the planet and thereby transforming the daily lives of literally hundreds of millions of people. And sometimes I'm reminded by, in a sense, the extraordinary moment in which we live where technology has now allowed us to harness the power of the sun. And yet some of the most energy challenged and poor people, for example, a family household in Mali or Burkina Faso or Niger, who to this day has no access to electricity, happens to live in a spot on this planet that has more energy than is required to power the entire world in the year 2021. That is the moment in time in which we find ourselves. And therefore, the second critical lever, as we have already heard, is finance. We need more finance from both public and private sector. And it is estimated that clean energy investments need to more than triple every year to around four trillion annually by 2030. Now, some might say, well, where is that extra money going to come from? Well, a significant part of it is already budgeted and in a sense in national planning processes, but it is still geared towards an energy matrix of the 20th century. It simply needs to be repurposed and redirected. And then yes, we also have to increase financing, particularly for countries who need support in this transition, a just transition. 
Yet objectives like these are very much achievable. That will require the kind of enabling policies that we have all discussed for years now, and we are seeing in many countries them actually being implemented and succeeding. That's why you have countries today that already can speak with both confidence and successful track records of having moved into a renewable energy system with 30, 40, 50, some soon 60 to 70 percent of their electricity generating capacity being renewable. So, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, at UNDP, and you know, not just as co-chair, proudly with Dami Lola and in terms of the high-level dialogue on energy, but also heading the United Nations Development Program, we embrace this challenge wholeheartedly in terms of the transformational potential. For instance, UNDP's climate promise that we have implemented over the last two years has, in, has supported 119 countries in developing their national climate strategies, their indices to drive down carbon emissions while expanding access to energy and also addressing the need for adaptation because we have already lost too much time. And for the first time in our history, we have put a very bold goal forward for the next four years of our strategic plan, which is our contribution to the Energy Compact, a commitment to contribute to providing access to clean and affordable energy to 500 million additional people. This is extraordinarily ambitious, but it also reflects our confidence in this moment in time. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, our current energy system is the leading cause of the climate crisis, which hits the world's poorest and most vulnerable the hardest, both in excluding them from access to energy, but also in the consequence of climate change. As Inger also said, it is time to ask hard questions. Can we really live in a world in which healthcare facilities grind to a halt, for instance, in the midst of a pandemic due to lack of power, where millions of people and businesses are being left behind from the benefits of economic development, improved livelihoods because they don't have access to something most fundamental to development, power, electricity. It is a moment in which we have to make courageous choices. Too many people, leaders in government, in business, but in our communities also, have not shown that courage for too long. And yet we are celebrating today the precise opposite. And the new energy compacts that are being presented in this high level dialogue on energy are precisely the kind of illustration of these choices being made that will define the well-being of people and planet for generations to come. To global leaders gathering in New York for this UN General Assembly, I call on you, I invite you to lead from the front and make those brave decisions as the energy revolution mass marches forward. We in the United Nations family are right behind you, next to you, and ready to support you. Thank you so much, and uh, Nishai, back to you. Thank you so very much, Achim Steiner. It was good to hear about your own uh, bold uh, energy compact pledge there. 500 million people, additional people, brought into the modern electricity world. I'd like to find out more about that, wouldn't you? Let's go to the UNDP web website and do so. That's just one of very many compacts that we've been highlighting to you in the last uh, day and a half or so. Here are some more. In fact, actually, before I introduce you to them, why don't we have a little step back and a refresh on what exactly an energy compact is? Who is it bringing together? How does it hope to actually deliver these specific goals? Here's a little film as a refresher. What are energy compacts? Nearly 800 million people don't have access to electricity. Close to 3 billion don't have access to clean cooking fuels or technologies. And renewable energy delivers less than a third of electricity generation. Affordable and clean energy for all in the next decade requires urgent action. Governments, businesses, finance, development organizations and others need to join forces to meet this ambition. Energy compacts have been created to move us forward together. They are designed to be ambitious commitments on Sustainable Development Goal 7 that support action and collaboration. Energy compacts are voluntary commitments to specific actions to accelerate progress on energy access, renewable energy, and energy efficiency. They will bring us closer to Sustainable Development Goal 7 by 2030 in line with the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. Compacts are open to any government or organization that supports energy access and clean energy transitions. For example, a national government might commit to expanding access to clean cooking solutions to 70% of their population by 2025. A business might commit to 100% renewable energy consumption by 2030. 
and a civil society group might commit to capacity building to support a government to realize its stated goals. Any commitment must be backed by a clear set of actions, and these must align with sustainable development goals and the Paris Agreement, including nationally determined contributions. Energy compact commitments will be tracked over time. This makes us all accountable for the goals we have set for ourselves. The compacts have been launched as part of the upcoming UN High-Level Dialogue on Energy, being held in September 2021. But energy compacts will be an important platform for action on the clean energy transition for years to come. And just to give you a flavor of the diversity of energy compacts that have already been given to us, you can take a look at our website. Down below, you can see at the bottom of the screen the, the link there. And also on this platform, there's an energy compacts tab. You can catch up on some of the videos we showed yesterday and the compacts that are being announced daily. Here's another little roundup, which will give you a flavor of the kinds of organizations and the regions that we're covering. For instance, from the private sector coming up, we've got Iberdrola from Spain, big energy giant. Uh, we've got a Brazilian bank, BNDES, um, from Dubai. We have BR, the um, MENA region's leading sustainability pioneer. At a regional governmental level, we'll be hearing from the Basque region minister on the hydrogen economy plans that they have. And at a national level, we're going to hear from the Danish energy minister. So take a look at the variety of compacts we have here now. More than 20 years ago, Iberdrola took the Kyoto Protocol seriously and started our energy transition. At 120 billion euros invested in renewable smart grid energy storage, we transformed the company from a local Spanish utility with coal and oil into a global leader in renewables, with today more than 35,000 megawatt and emissions that are only 40 grams, which is one fourth of those of our peers and presence in more than 30 countries. The obstacle during the period we are huge. We have to fight against governments, regulators and competitors. But we show that it is possible to build a strong, profitable business, generate wealth and jobs and leave a better planet for our children and grandchildren. We need to focus on the impact of climate change for humankind. The sustainable development goals are the best guidance. In fact, we were pioneers to include them in our bylaws. Today, almost everyone is convinced of the need to fight against climate change. We collaborate with many actors, government, civil society, and other companies that, instead of enemies, are now just competitors or even partners. I am delighted to see that Narancha Tapia is in this panel. The Basque country is a good example for climate ambition, but also for industrial leadership. But it's a still a long way to reach our objectives. Let me insist in two very clear messages. The United Nations is playing a key role in the fight against climate change. You started this effort globally with the Kyoto Protocol and the Secretary General has a clear view of the urgency of the situation. The COP26 will be a crucial moment to show our commitment will be the main sponsors in Glasgow, where Iberdrola and Scottish Power Headquarters are located. I have been involved in all COP since Copenhagen, and it's impressive to see the progress achieved. But it's still not enough. We will not reach our goal if we don't invest massively in renewable energies, smart grid and storage. And this only happens if we have clear and stable framework that give investor security and confidence. Faster administrative processes to accelerate the expansion of renewables and grid. It takes four or five years to have the permit for a solar or wind plant and only one year to build it. And we need new tax policies that promote decarbonization based on the principle who pollutes pay. We are still very far from there and every day counts. If we start today, I believe, we will succeed in the fight against climate change, but we will also build a stronger, more sustainable economy, able to create high quality jobs massively. Iberdola has been doing that for 20 years, and we are ready to continue 
in the coming decade with an investment plan of $170 billion up to 2030. They will allow us to be carbon zero. Hello, I'm Gustavo Montesano, the CEO of BNDS, the Brazilian Development Bank. Amazon is a wonderful land with many beauties and biodiversity, but it faces many contradictions. One of them is that in this natural paradise, there are 3 million Brazilians who are not connected to the Brazilian power grid. Our power grid is now as one of the top renewable energy matrix in the world. And those autonomous systems, they are all oil based. So all those communities that live in far distant regions of the Amazon, they generate a cost of $1.5 billion a year to pay for oil, dirty energy. I'll try it with these situations. The NDS, who is one of the largest renewable energy lenders in the world, alongside with Eletrobras, who is the largest power company in Latin America, we join forces to change this forever. We cannot accept this situation. That's why we're proposing a joint compact to promote decarbonization of the power mix of those autonomous regions in the Amazon, replacing dirty oil expensive generation with clean, renewable, and sustainable accessible energy in the Amazon forest. And the more partners accept to come alongside with us to solve the situations, the more successful we'll be. Any member, any agent will be very welcome to join forces with BNDS and Electrobras. So come alongside with us to support this initiative that is crucial to sustainable development of the Amazon forest. Thank you very much. See you. The vast government from a region with its own identity and internationally recognized industrial and technological positioning has incorporated two innovative initiatives for its energy compact. In any case, we are aware that in addition to these two initiatives, we are going to have to deploy all kinds of activities that contribute to promote the energy transition and action on climate change. With the initiative focused on hydrogen, we assume the commitment to create an ecosystem for the production, distribution and consumption of hydrogen in the Basque Country based on our industrial, logistical and technological capacities. By 2030, we foresee an installed electrolysis capacity of 300 megawatts and that 100% of the produced hydrogen will be of renewable or low carbon origin. We are currently building a new business technology park with the presence of different companies and knowledge and research centers in the field of hydrogen. It is estimated that until 2026, 1,300 million euros will be invested and that 1.3 thousand direct jobs and 6.7 thousand indirect jobs will be created. The second initiative called Equiola, a program with which we will create citizen cooperatives and will allow citizens to participate in the generation and management of photovoltaic plants of between 1 and 5 megawatts. Each cooperative will build and manage photovoltaic parts that will produce energy based on the demand required by the cooperative members themselves. The program has started in 2021 and we have 10 management cooperatives and we are about to create the first consumer cooperative. We would like to have about 40 cooperatives by 2024 although one of the complexities lies in the economic involvement that it requires from families. The minimum number of participants required to develop an energy community under the Kiola initiative is 400 citizens. This represents the participation of between 12 and 20,000 families by 2024. Both actions, that of hydrogen with a technological and industrial nature, and Ekiola, with social assets and private individuals, add up and express the reality of the energy transition and action on climate change. It is about the need for a country framework agreement that we focus on our Basque Green Deal, 
with an anticipation, mitigation, and above all, planning and action strategy. An energy, climate, social, and an economic challenge in which the Basque government wants to involve all local institutions, economic and social agents, as well as citizens, especially with the younger generation in mind. I'm very proud to present the Danish Energy Compact, reducing national CO2 emissions by 70% in 2030 compared to 1990. This is the ambitious goal that we've set for ourselves in Denmark. Transforming the energy system is key to make it happen. In Denmark, we expect to cover 100% of our electricity demand with renewable energy by 2028. Denmark is also committed to increase ambition on mitigation, adaptation and finance in support of the most vulnerable countries on the planet. This is why we will scale up climate finance for developing countries to at least 500 million US dollars annually by 2023. This is double the amount of 2019. We are strengthening our efforts to mobilize public and private finance from a variety of sources to accelerate the green transition globally. This means that the Danish contribution will represent at least 1% of the collective target of mobilizing 100 million US dollars. This is well above Denmark's share of developed countries, GNI. Internationally, Denmark is also working to phase out coal, oil and gas. And we're providing technical assistance and capacity building in the spirit of the Paris Agreement. This we're doing in 19 different countries through bilateral energy corporations. These and many other initiatives are highlighted in our energy compact. We have a lot of work ahead of us. Let's get to it. Hello, everyone. I'd like to thank the UNHLDE for facilitating this session. It's an honor to be speaking alongside leaders who are critical to shaping clean energy initiatives around the world. I am Khaled al Haraymel. I am the group CEO of BIA. We are a leading environmental management company in the UAE and our vision is to pioneer a sustainable quality of life in the Middle East. We work towards this vision by providing a full scale of environmental solutions, including waste management and recycling, uh, consulting and research, sustainable transport, digital solutions, and of course, clean energy. Our targets are driven by the UAE's agenda for sustainability and clean energy, which aligns with the SDG 7 and Paris Agreement. UAE's energy compacts will facilitate 30% of power from clean energy sources by 2030 and 70% by 2050. To begin our contribution to national targets, BIA has three key clean energy projects in the Emirate of Sharjah and the UAE. The first one is in partnership with Mustar, the Abu Dhabi Future Energy Company. BIA has launched a waste to energy plant. The plant will turn unrecyclable waste into energy source increasing the landfill diversion rate in Sharjah from 76% to 100. As a result, Sharjah will become the first zero waste city in the region. Annually, the waste to energy plant will process up to 300,000 tons of waste and displace 450,000 tons of CO2 emissions. Our second clean energy project is our solar landfill. As Sharjah becomes a zero waste city, the 47 hectare landfill will be sealed. So that the land is not left unutilized, we are building a 120 megawatt solar plant on top of it. In addition, our new headquarters, a LEED Platinum certified building that will be carbon neutral, will also be powered by its own solar plant. The third clean energy project is our waste to hydrogen plant in partnerships with Chinook Sciences from the UK. Through gasification technology, unrecyclable plastic and wood waste will become a source for green hydrogen. Green hydrogen from the plant will be fed into a fueling station, powering a fleet of hydrogen vehicles daily. Through these initiatives, BIA hopes to demonstrate that clean energy projects are not only critical for our environment, but also financially viable and scalable to meet modern energy demands. Thank you. The CEO of BIA in the UAE rounding up that little uh, segment of energy compacts. There were some really eye-catching pledges there. I was particularly struck by the call from Brazil to clean up 
and decarbonize power to the Amazon forests and a, and a call for others to join in. Were you listening? Well, here we've got some more energy compacts coming up for you from some young people, H A sorry, say that again, SDG7 Youth Constituency Compact is one of them. And do you remember Inga Anderson from UNEP talking about the cool climate, the cool coalition compact? Well, they're about to speak too. Let's have a little listen. In a warming world, access to cooling is not a luxury. We all depend on it. Cooling solutions can deliver on the sustainable development goals by improving agricultural supply chains and boosting farming income, guaranteeing vaccine cold chains, preventing heat-related deaths, and improving comfort and productivity. We need to rapidly expand access to cooling, but these solutions must be efficient and climate-friendly to achieve the Paris Agreement and Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol. The Sustainable Energy for All initiative and the Cool Coalition hosted by UNEP are launching a compact on sustainable cooling for all to accelerate action towards efficient, climate-friendly cooling and cold chain. By developing national cooling action plans and sustainable cold chain strategy, by implementing minimum energy performance standards, by joining the race to zero, you can help us make sustainable cooling for all a reality. Be cool and join us. Excellencies, members of the audience, the climate crisis is here with scientific evidence before our eyes pointing towards a cataclysmic future. This cannot be ignored and the youth are rallying to address and limit the unprecedented effects of the climate crisis. In the coming months, the SDG 7 Youth Constituency will work to, firstly, ensure inclusion of youth priorities in the global and national energy transition agendas. Secondly, help youth-led organizations to access scale-up and startup funding and promote their commitments and actions to support achievement of SDG 7. Thirdly, create initiatives which seek to train at least 3,000 young people annually on how they could actively contribute to achievement of SDG 7. While we are mobilizing youth to take action, we urge member states and other stakeholders to raise their ambitions and ensure a rapid, inclusive, and just energy transition. We call on you to increase funding for clean energy innovators and enterprises, support training of the clean energy sector workforce, and establish channels for civic participation in decision making. In addition to being bold, energy compacts should fully reflect the needs of the youth. And with this in mind, we vow to hold to account both your actions and your pledges. History will judge us harshly if we do too little or too late to advance the energy transition. We cannot afford it. Help the next generation advance the most ambitious goals of the energy transition. We face the greatest existential challenge of our age and the fate of the human condition lies in our hands. Wasn't that an inspiring call? The fate of humanity does indeed lie in our hands. And we're going to share with you one more energy compact before a couple of panel discussions coming up just the other side of the top of the hour. And this, let me introduce you now to David Lecoq and his phenomenal team warming. at AR, the Alliance for Rural Electrification, which is the oldest and largest global business association for renewables in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Let's take a look. Of millions of people and businesses are already powered by decentralized renewable energy today, all over Africa, Asia, and Latin America, often for the very first time. Hi, my name is David Lecoq, and I work with the Alliance for Rural Electrification, known as ARE. ARE today brings together around 200 member companies and organizations all along the decentralized renewable energy value chain, delivering clean power all over Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Currently, around 800 million people still do not have access to electricity, and an additional 1.5 billion have an unreliable connection. 
This keeps communities in the dark and it hampers sustainable and economic development. In parallel, not enough jobs are being created and the climate is changing for the worse. So what to do? What to do to put the world back on track and to meet the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations by 2030. For its part, ARE, fueled by its huge growth over the past year, and together with all our members and the wider sector, is ready to step up to the plate, to scale up immensely and to, in effect, meet the challenges that we have in front of us today. That is why ARE is very proud to present to you today its brand new Energy Compact. Very concretely, by 2030, ARE strives to enable the private sector to deliver an additional 500 million electricity connections, to catalyze 5 million green jobs, and to help avoid at least 1 billion tons of CO2 equivalent emissions. This is the commitment of ARE, this is the commitment of the sector that we are representing. So with this, we are reaching out to you, the governments, the philanthropies and the corporate world to join hands and to effectively join the ARE movement so that we can work together to reach these ambitious yet eminently achievable targets for a prosperous, a green and an electrified tomorrow. Thank you very much for your attention. We've just heard that these are ambitious but eminently achievable targets. So how do we achieve them? That's going to be the focus of our next panel discussion, which is called Advancing the Energy Transition in End-Use Sectors. They're going to look beyond electrification to greening other end-use sectors and, of course, energy efficiency, which we keep hearing about. And to give us some framing thoughts to set up this panel discussion, we're pleased to have this contribution from David Marchik, the COO of the IDFC, the International Development Finance Corporation. Hello, my name is David Marchik, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer of the United States International Development Finance Corporation, or DFC. As America's development finance institution, the DFC partners with private sector entities all around the world to finance solutions to the most critical problems facing emerging markets today. Insufficient energy access in developing countries is one of the world's greatest development challenges. Energy poverty poses a significant hurdle, not only to quality of life, but also to health and economic growth. And the climate crisis we all know represents one of the most urgent challenges of our time, an existential threat, especially for emerging economies, which are particularly vulnerable to the impacts of the crisis. To combat these challenges, the DFC is focused on advancing the United States support for SDG 7 by expanding access to affordable and reliable electricity across developing markets while reducing global emissions. Through our development strategy, the Roadmap for Impact, we've established the goal of expanding and providing energy access to at least 10 million people in the developing world by 2025, and we're well on our way to achieving that goal. Just a couple of months ago, for example, we announced a project in Sierra Leone, a power project which will electrify 25% of that country. Our work in the energy sector also has a strong focus on climate and we're driving renewable projects all around the world. DFC's work to support SDG 7 will allow for continued economic growth in the countries that need electricity generation the most. By bolstering investments in climate solutions and expanding access to renewable energy, we can make a meaningful impact on people's lives and move the planet towards a more sustainable future. Thank you very much. 
David Marchick there, setting the scene really for our panel discussion. And I'm going to hand over smartly now to our panel moderator, Dr. Nawal al Hassani, permanent representative of the UAE to IRENA and a hugely committed leader in the climate action space. Over to you, Nawal. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nisha. Uh, thank you very much for uh, such an amazing introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the UN High Level Dialogue on Energy and welcome to our next session on advancing the energy transition. I do have the pleasure of moderating the next 20 minutes or so with some truly inspire, inspiring thought leaders in the fields of renewable energy, sustainability, and very importantly, youth engagement. As you know, the global energy transition is no longer optional. It is essential if we are to preserve our people, planet, and prosperity. The electrification and greening of end user sectors are integral to this aim, this aim. In fact, a recent study from IRENA has shown that more than 90% of the solutions that will achieve the 1.5 degrees goal of the Paris Agreement by 2050 involve renewable energy applications, whether that's through direct supply, electrification, improved energy efficiency, green hydrogen, or bioenergy combined with carbon capture and storage. Renewables are the solution. But how? How we align as an international community on the best way forward to ensure that those most at risk from climate change and a lack of access to clean energy are not left behind is the topic of our time. Joining me to discuss these topics are the Right Honourable Patricia Scotland, Secretary General of the Commonwealth, Oliver Bloom, Chief Sustainability, sorry, Chief Strategy and Sustainability Officer, Schneider Electric, Alexander Commission, Chairperson of the BRICS Youth Energy Agency. Welcome to you all. Hello, good evening. Hi, good evening. So I would like to start this panel by turning to the Right Honourable Patricia Scotland. I wonder if you could capture for us the importance of this moment as someone born in Dominica and moved to the United Kingdom at a young age. You will have a keen interest in the way the developing and developed economies are able to tackle and mitigate the consequences of the climate crisis. How can the global energy transition improve the lives and prospects of people around the world? And what do we need to see from a political and policy making level to ensure we have the best chance of successfully rolling it out across the world? Well, thank you, Noel. And it's really great to be with you on this panel. Now, as you know, with the rest of the world, the 54 uh, Commonwealth countries are facing challenges from the global warming caused by the increased emissions of greenhouse gases two thirds of which emanate from the production and use of energy in many developing member countries also have significant energy access gap and expanding energy access is a priority for sustainable development and more than half of the 759 million people across the globe without access to electricity live in our Commonwealth countries. And recognition, I think, continues to grow of the need for new levels of ambition in current efforts to recarbonize and transform the global energy system. So the message is clear. We must urgently step up our action to implement the Paris Agreement and achieve our commitments on sustainable energy. And whilst the transition pathways they differ across the Commonwealth countries, the move to clean energy systems is a common goal. And the economics of the transition are such that low carbon technologies are becoming increasingly uh, competitive and risks are better understood and investment in renewable energy is thankfully rapidly growing. However, strong political will and ambition is required to establish the enabling frameworks that set the policy, the regulatory, economic, financial measures to further attract finance and scale up technology and lower costs. Now, a recent study by the Commonwealth Secretariat found that Commonwealth countries mm. were modestly progressing in terms of increasing access to modern energy and access to clean cooking. However, large gaps 
generally remain and critically important to the achievement of these goals is adopting technologies and securing the significant investment required for their implementation. So what we are looking at in the Commonwealth with um, uh, sustainable energy for all is, so what do we do? How do we convert this into real action? And what we've done is we've come up with a toolkit for the small, uh, um, the SIDS, and you know that 38 countries classified by the UN as small island developing states, but 25 of them are in our Commonwealth family. So despite the significant clean energy resource potential, SIDS are characterized by their heavy dependence on imported fossil fuels that result in some of the highest electricity costs in the world and significant uh, supply chain challenges, which puts real pressure on already constrained economies. So the pandemic has made it worse. It's increased the vulnerabilities of SIDS in varying degrees, and it's highlighted the need to transition towards clean energy, to increase energy security and economic resist, uh, resilience. So to address this challenge, the Commonwealth Secretariat under the Commonwealth Sustainable Energy Transitions Agenda and Sustainable Energy for All have jointly developed this toolkit to assist SIDS develop business cases and strategies to facilitate investment in clean energy projects, particularly in the power sector. And the toolkit will be utilized to develop country specific business cases that detail cost benefit analysis and strategies needed to unlock investment and guide the formulation of recommendations that seek to maximize the socioeconomic and climate benefits of a clean energy pathway. And SIDS will be supported to translate their clean energy transition plans into real business and investment opportunities with detailed information for investors on the country specific elements. Now, this is vital because it will be a key enabler, such as finance and international support required for this transition. And we're hoping that we'll get to launch the toolkit on the thematic day for energy on the 4th of November 2021, we got um, a wonderful opportunity at COP and we will hopefully be showcasing this in our pavilion. So I hope everyone's gonna come along and really help us. The study is really important because it's emphasizing the need that our Commonwealth countries have to get the pricing right for energy commodities and we're really recommending the introduction of a carbon pricing policy to account for the negative externalities of carbon emissions and ending any price distortions arising from subsidies uh, to hybo, uh, hydrocarbon fuels. So a carbon price and the elimination of the fossil fuels subsidies will reinforce the trend of falling costs for renewable energy and facilitate the adoption of these technologies and the financial resources available from carbon price revenues and the savings from elimination of subsidies can be used to support the development of the new technologies and hasten the ne necessary transition to these technologies. If we really are not going to leave people behind, we've got to find the practical ways of enabling this transition to take place in the least painful way possible. And we've got to enable all of us to get there, not just the SIDS, but also we've got to look at those countries who are 98% dependent on commodities. And we've got to build a bridge so they can transition in the way they would like to, but they need the resources to actually do it. So there's a big task for us, but I reckon that if we work together, we can do this. So speaking about working together, can I have just a quick follow up? As someone who has fought fiercely for the rights and recognition of women, how critical is it that women play a central role in this once in a generation transition? I think it's vital because, you know, we are 50, or just over 50 percent of the world's population. And yet if you look at how badly women are disadvantaged in this area, it's heartbreaking. The renewable energy sector offers, you know, diverse um, opportunities, but how many women are enabled to participate in this? Arena, as you know, estimates that 32% 
of women are employed in renewable energy industry compared to 22% in the energy sector overall. But still, within renewables, women's participation in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, the STEM jobs, is far lower than in administrative jobs. So, well, well, if we're going to use all the talent, we have to take advantage of the extraordinary talent we have in women. And I'm so proud of what Irina is doing to highlight these issues. Because if you look at women in many developing member countries, they spend 1.4 hours a day collecting fuel for wood to, to cook with, four hours in cooking. And they are the ones spending most of the time in the household. And they are disproportionately affected by indoor pollution. And the World Health Authority estimates that household air pollution causes 4 million premature deaths every year. And the Commonwealth Secretariat, through its sustainable energy programs, we want to do something about it. And women are right at the core of that. So we're supporting member countries to focus on solutions for clean cooking through peer-to-peer -peer exchanges and access to clean cooking technology. We're encouraging greater participation of women in this rapidly growing sector, uh, so that whilst ensuring the fair distribution of socio-economic opportunities for the global energy transformation. And you know that I believe that unless we have women involved in this, we haven't got a hope of succeeding. So we've got to promote the inclusive, energy transition, mainstreaming gender to increase women, and I have to say youth, because you know 60% of our Commonwealth is under the age of 30, and it's their future, so we've got to make sure that young people are involved in this, that they're participating in the policy making, in the energy transition, the value chains in our member countries. And okay. we're doing something about it by creating um, books for targeted at our seven to 12 year olds. So we can't leave anyone behind. It's going to take all of us. Um, absolutely, and absolutely. Sure, you know, about making sure women, and I'm glad there are two of us on this call. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Absolutely. And, 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 and this actually brings us back to a, a very important question on, 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 on who is responsible to do what. So it's now uh, a, a good opportunity to turn to you, uh, Mr. Bloom. I would like you, I would like to look at the uh, corporate and the role of corporates in the, uh, in, in this equation. Uh, in keeping with the work that Schneider Electric, Electric does to help make business more sustainable, how can business models be redesigned to integrate renewable energy into their mix? How can big business be part of the energy transition? And if we have time, secondly, what innovations are needed in the technologies we have at our disposal to, to boost sustainable practices and renewable energy use? So I'm, I'm giving you two questions at one, and I hope you will have time to address both of them. I'll, I'll do my best. Thank you for having me, first of all. And, and probably just to rebound on the previous question, just to let you know that for a company like Schneider, with a tech and industrial company, we have 45% of female in our executive committee at Schneider. So just to tell you that it's possible, we were at 10 probably five years ago, but, but as you rightly said, the participation of female in this transformation is very critical. And I have a good news, by the way, our female talents are passionate by sustainability and climate transition. And we see more and more female coming from the engineering background want to participate. Now, moving to your, to your question, I'm not going, of course, to, to, to set the stage of why we need to go faster, because I'm sure everyone knows that we are behind the commitment of the Paris Agreement and we have to go, go much faster. At Schneider Electric, we are, you know, as we say, a digital partner to help our customers for efficiency and more sustainability. And of course, there are a lot of things we are doing for our own company, but we have been also supporting, because it's our job and mission in life, many, many multinational in the past 10 years to go through their own energy transition. So I will probably use that experience that we have accumulated to answer your question. First, there is a good news. Corporate world is moving. I think we have seen a huge acceleration in the past 24 months. All companies in the world are building their pledge, they are building their action plan, they are, they are progressing. And we see also the investor having a strong focus. That's a very good news. We know it's not enough. But I can tell you, compared to two years ago, we see that the corporate world is finally moving. 
Just an example, an article I was reading this morning, 85% of board in the largest French company have now a dedicated committee to supervise the sustainability strategy and therefore the environment strategy. So, so that's good news. Now, this point being said, what I can share, we see very, very different profile of corporate company. Some of them who have started earlier, some of them who are just joining, but for sure they need all of them to go faster. What, what the best of them, probably, that's the most interesting to answer your question, what the best of the company are, 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 are doing? Three things, they strategize, they digitize, they decarbonize. What I mean by strategize, like any kind of other business topic in a company, you cannot address the climate change differently. You need to have a strategy, which means that you need to measure where you start, you need to define your trajectory, and you need to define a, a roadmap with clear milestone. But the most important, you need to make sure the leadership is engaged. Point number two, you need to digitize. And that's very, very important because I think we, we are always very theoretical about both climate pledge and so on and so forth. But I'll give you a parallel. Would you imagine a large company in the world of today managing its company without an ERP for finance measurement? In the world of tomorrow, the only way to tackle the climate transition is to make sure that all large multinationals also an ERP for energy and sustainability purpose. The objective at the end of the day is to track and measure your energy consumption and how you are going to evolve your, with your uh, own CO2 emission. And the third part, I call it decarbonize because this is what you can do to reduce your energy consumption. So back to your question, it's a lot about energy efficiency, how you can replace by leveraging more renewable. And the third piece is really how you engage your entire uh, ecosystem. I'm not going to give you too much detail on each of them because we don't have the time today, but of course, energy efficiency is very, very critical. Access to renewable energy is very important. Uh, I tell you, for instance, at Schneider, I think we moved from 10% of renewable energy to 80% in the past three years. So just to tell to other companies that it's possible and that it's a must if you want really to go uh, towards your 1.5 degree trajectory. And the last point I'd like to mention really to address your specific question on business model. Yes, companies have to revisit a very, very large number of existing process and business model. Maybe if I just take one example to connect with the topic of circularity, I think all of us as company, we have to reinvent what we do in our business. And that can start with not selling any more product, but more and more looking at, can we rent solution? In our case, that will be, for instance, what we call energy as a service. Second example is how do we extend the life of our product, but it means that you have to restart from the design of your product to make sure that those products can be repairable, they can be retrofitable. That's very, very important. Can we introduce more sharing economy also in our industry and without mentioning, of course, things like recycle material. So yes, to answer your question, definitely, we need to revisit our business model because if we just look at reducing our energy consumption, therefore CO2 emission on the basis of what we are going to do, what we are doing today, we will only tackle one part of the equation. The only way to get to the trajectory of 1.5 is to revisit completely the way we are doing business in our company. And I will just give you an example also. It's not only what you do in your own scope one and two, which are your direct and indirect emission, but it's also what you do with your own ecosystem and your supplier and how you can engage them in that journey. And I will finish to manage the time on your second question, you know, on innovation. I have a good and a bad news, and the bad news probably for you, innovation technology are available today. The, 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 we, we don't need to invent too much. Of course, we can always innovate for more, more progress, for more technology, but the technology are available today to deliver what I've just described in the past minutes. It's just a question of willingness. And the second point that I would like to mention, we don't have the time to wait 10 more years for more technology. We have to act fast. We have to act now. And the good news is digital has made a lot of progresses in the past 10 years. And the digital technology are an enabler for this active energy management. And I will finish probably with one exception that has been mentioned in the first part of our panel. There is probably in the world, and the number can change depending on the source, but 800 million people who don't have access to energy. And that's a place where we still need to innovate. 
if we want to provide green and affordable energy to the people who have zero access or limited access, that's definitely an area where we need to bring much more innovation. But for the rest of the world, I think technology available is just a question of willingness to make it happen and to make it happen now. Absolutely, absolutely. We, we, we know we know enough on what can be done and what should be done. And then we also need to engage with, with, with each other to, 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 have, to make it happen. So Alexander, I would like to come to you now to focus on the next generation of climate activists and con conserv conservationists. How have you seen young people from the BRICS countries unite to develop the energy agenda? And if we have time, uh, what is unique about the experience of young people from Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa? that the rest of the world can learn from. Thank you, Dr. Al-Hassani, for this. And, and well, I can assure you that the BRICS countries were at the front line of the youth energy engagements and youth-led actions. Uh, in 2015, when the United Nations General Assembly introduced the Agenda 2030, the BRICS youth announced that they will launch a youth-led agency to take a BRICS stance in the issues of energy development and promoting the role of young people in the decision-making process. Since then, a lot has been achieved. And basically, I'm a live example that the BRICS youth has made it, has leveraged their voices to such global and driven discussions. For instance, our annual flagship BRICS Youth Energy Outlook, which reflects the vision of the youth for prospective energy challenges, is annually reviewed by five ministers of energy. The BRICS hats of state and their administrations consider the achievements of the energy youth and highlight them in their summits de declarations and documents. Additionally, the BRICS youth has not only been driving very successful initiatives and campaigns like from BRICS with SDG and the BRICS Sustainable Ideas Bank, but created a real working channel to include the youth and in SDG 7 policy advocacy and now presents their own youth energy compact with potential impact audience over 100 million people. Can you imagine that? And in this regard, BRICS youth have not only developed three energy cooperation tracks between the BRICS countries, which are research, climate, sustainability, and of course the policy advocacy, but also had managed to bring BRICS perspective to the key, uh, key international platforms like UN, LCLDE, and of course the COP26, where we'll be also there and facilitating you all, all the way uh, to uh, 2030. And something concerning the unique um, experience that might be taken from BRICS countries is of course that it is uh, actually not limited only to five countries. Throughout the years, the community has become a truly global platform for youth uh, from the developing world to drive action and promote their youth vision for the future of energy. And that means that the topics we prioritize and the way we do things in BRICS is also appealing to the rest of the world. Therefore, I'm certain that we are on the right path. We just don't copy others. Uh, having said that, I believe that young people from BRICS countries and beyond appreciate open partnership and commitment uh, that we are constantly pursuing. And this is something that I would call unique. Fantastic, fantastic. Uh, thank you very much. Does anybody would like to maybe comment on uh, the role the youth has to play in this in this important uh, work that we are all trying to pursue? Well, on my, my side, what, what I would like to say, th their role is fundamental. And I, and I like to say that the good news we have is that the youth of today have a lot of knowledge that they can immediately uh, bring to, to companies and I'm sure to other organizations. And we see it in our company like Schneider. You hire people who are 25 years old. They are already very much digital native, obviously, compared to some other generation. But they are so passionate about sustainability and climate change that they are also a very big source of innovation for companies. So yes, I do believe that they have a very, very, role to play, a very big role to play in, uh, in the private companies. And of course, as I've made clear, with 60% of our uh, population in the Commonwealth, we've got about two point, almost 2.5 billion people. They are amazingly important because they are the majority. 
And in terms of the future, of course, this is their world. And what we have found is when you engage young people at every level, on the policy level, on the implementation level, you really get a very uh, high quality outcome because they can help you to know how do you take uh, control of an agenda in a way that will be attractive and engage them. And without them, that doesn't happen. So I think looking through their eyes, walking with them is a hugely enriching for all of us. And we in the Commonwealth certainly have taken that view and we're supporting them through the Innovation Awards, which I'm about to, to launch. And they're coming up with some brilliant innovative ideas. And it's really interesting to see that the majority of people who come up with brilliant ideas, unfortunately, tend to come up with them before they're 30. So the three of us on our call may be a bit challenged, but uh, one of us may not be. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody, for your input. Absolutely right. This has been a truly insightful and inspirational session, which as someone who is passionate about capturing the promise of the global energy transition has been a huge pleasure to be part of. To put our dialogue of the last 20 minutes into context, I will conclude by saying we don't get a second chance when it comes to our planet. This is the only one we will ever get. We have heard today from the political of we have heard today of the political will, the requirements from the corporate and business world, and the wholehearted commitment of young people from across the world to making the global energy transition come to fruition. The least we can do is our individual part. And collectively, we will make this moment the time that we turn the tide on the climate crisis. Thank you. I wish you a productive and fruitful discussions for the rest of the summit. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nawal al Hosseini, and to your great panelists. I was particularly struck by what we heard about the fact that we've got the technologies available now. We don't need to wait for a huge wave of innovations in so many areas, but there is one area where we really do need to come up with more innovation, and that is to make sure that we deliver on SDG 7. So it's interesting to get the complexion of the different challenges there. Thank you very much, panelists. <music>so joining us now live we have a number of leaders who are going to tell us about their particular uh, energy compacts from different parts of the world and how they expect to deliver from them first we're going to go over to delhi in india and we're going to join samant uh, sinha who's the founder chairman and ceo of renew power and um he is an award-winning leader really in this field so let's cross over to you now and say Hello, how are you doing, Saman? Hey, I'm good, Nisha. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, uh, yeah, so let me just talk about our energy compact. Uh, Renew Power is India's largest renewable energy company. We generate about 1% of India's total electricity production and so far help mitigate about half a percent of India's total carbon emissions. Um, we are, uh, uh, as part of our energy compact, uh, we have agreed to the following, that we will reach a renewable energy generation capacity of 18 gigawatts or 18,000 megawatts by the year 2025, up from our current installed 6,000 megawatts. So that's a three times growth in our total capacity in the next four years. Uh, two, that we will also be looking at uh, round the clock power through renewable energy, which is actually quite unique because as we all know, renewable energy is intermittent power. We will provide renewable uh, energy, which is round the clock power, and we will do so at a price that is at least 20% lower than the price of alternative uh, coal-based power. Uh, we will do this by uh, all the way up till 2027. Uh, number three, that we, we pledge that we will uh, improve our energy efficiency through digital analytics and artificial intelligence, that we will deploy a minimum of 30 use cases uh, so as to improve our productivity of our assets by at least one and a half to two percent by the year 2025. Uh, three, uh, four, that we will actually improve our energy efficiency uh, of our assets by two to two and a half percent over the current values by 2030. 
and uh, five that we will get into manufacturing as well. So not only will we be a generator of renewable energy, we will also manufacture equipment, at least two gigawatts of solar cells and modules uh, by 2023, and at least 500 megawatts of wind turbines every year by 2023 as well. And we also pledged that we will become a net zero company by uh, 2050. Now, the uniqueness of our energy compacts is that no uh, renewable energy company at this point is talking about providing round the clock power using purely renewable energy sources uh, at a price that is cheaper than coal. So that I think is one area in which we are fairly unique. The second thing is we're talking about increasing our energy efficiency of our assets by at least two percentage points through the use of digital te technologies, which is again something that is fairly unique. And number three, that most renewable energy companies stay in the area of renewable energy generation. But we are pledging that we will also go into equipment manufacturing, which is very important for a country like India uh, to create the manufacturing ecosystem as well. And so the fact that we are pledging to get into manufacturing of solar equipment and wind equipment is fairly unique. So in that sense, our um, pledges are uh, fairly comprehensive. They cover across a broad area of renewable energy, but they're also fairly unique. And that is, I think, what will help differentiate our compacts from compacts of a number of other companies uh, in our segment as well. Thank you so much. Really clear, really comprehensive. Thank you very much, Suman Sinha. I was particularly struck by two in particular, bringing down the price of energy 20% lower than the conventional that's so important in terms of affordability and what you were saying about actually delivering much needed jobs with the equipment so you know really impressive thank you very much Saman Sinha. thank you okay we're going to move on now and we're joined by Cohn Peters who's the executive director of Gogla I hope I've pronounced that right which is really the voice of the off-grid solar industry let's hear what he has to say yeah, and thank you very much for the opportunity to be here uh, today. Um, I'd like to talk about the Gogla uh, Compact to power 1 billion lives before 2030. Uh, Gogla is an association of more than 200 off-grid companies and organizations worldwide. And over the past decades, our members have delivered standalone solar-powered uh, products to already more than 400 million people in the world. And by doing this, they deliver big uh, impacts and much better quality of life for the users of these products, uh, millions of jobs, billions of dollars of extra income for the households and SMEs, hundreds of millions of tons of reduced carbon dioxide emissions, and of course, making all these households, SMEs and farmers much more climate resilient. Our industry has shown that achieving universal electricity access is actually entirely possible. The technologies exist, the demand exists, the distribution model exists, and they're all proven and ready for replication. But what we do need to do is to scale up. And unfortunately, that's not happening right now. To achieve that scale, we primarily need to make it easier and more attractive for investors to invest in our industry. And we need to make our products more affordable for those people that still cannot pay for them right now. We need more concessional finance than we have today. But if all stakeholders in our sector work together, this is actually totally doable and with actually relatively small amounts of public funding. And our compact is thus about rallying all stakeholders companies, governments, investors, and development partners behind our common goal to power 1 billion lives by 2030. Already close to 100 partners are endorsing our compact. We are encouraged to see this excitement around our own compact, and we know that by aligning around our shared objective, we can achieve it, and we can ensure that no one is left behind in the clean energy transition. So I welcome everyone to join us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Cohen, and thank you for that call. Again, affordability, a key element of that compact we just heard from Gogla. I'm now going to talk to you about a joint venture between the FAO and IRENA. IRENA has been involved with energy compacts with a number of different organizations. And to tell us about this compact, I'm delighted to introduce again someone who joined us yesterday. So we're very pleased you can join us again, the Director General of IRENA, Francesco La Camera. The floor is yours, Mr. La Camera. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nishas. And it's uh, really a pleasure to see you again today. So, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me to join uh, Chu Donju, the Director General of, of uh, UNFAO, to showcase our joint energy compact 
on energizing agri-food system with renewable system, with renewable energy. Achieving the 2030 agenda and the Paris Agreement will require ambitious action-oriented partnership, cutting across sectors. The ARENA FAO partnership is one of such examples. Energy food systems are deeply connected. Agri-food systems consume about 30% of the world's energy. And energy is responsible of a third of agri-food system emissions. A joint approach to the energy transition food system, system transformation is therefore necessary. ARENA and FAO signed a memorandum of understanding this year to jointly advance uh, renewables adoption in agri-food chain. From primary production to processing and storage to cooking, renewables can play a crucial role to meet energy needs, raise income, cut food losses, enhance climate resilience, and improve access to clean cooked fuels. To tap into huge opportunity, this energy compact offers a set of concrete targets that we believe can galvanize stakeholders and facilitate investment on the ground. I will leave to my colleague and friends, the Director General of FAO, to share to you further details. Thank you very much for your attention and back to you, Shaina. Thank you so much, Mr. La Camera, and thank you for making the time to explaining to us yourself why Irina got involved in this important initiative, because indeed agri-food systems, biodiversity loss accounts for something like 30% of emissions and is so often ignored in the climate agenda. So now let's get a perspective from FAO. We have this statement now from the Director General Chu Dong Yu. I'm pleased to join my colleagues Francisco La Camera, Irana Chief, to showcase our joint energy compact. Through this energy compact, our target of the next five years is at least five countries is to undertake agri-food system assessment of renewable energy interventions at country and regional level. Support the pilot project the programs through the partnership with local and international stakeholders, strengthening the enabling environment for renewables adoption in terms of policy, capacity building, and project facilitation, and support the joint advocacy cross national, regional, and global forum on the energy food nexus. We invite interested governments provide sector, financial institution, and development partners to work together for food security and energy security in the rural areas. This is crucial to achieve our common vision for inclusive, resilient, and sustainable agri-food systems and energy systems for better production, better nutrition, a better environment, and a better life, leaving no one behind. Thank you. That's really interesting, isn't it? What you can do by bringing together two big UN agencies to put their efforts together and make sure that we can truly change even stubborn areas like agriculture and make and help the lives of people, for farmers living on the land and also reduce emissions. So now what am I going to talk to you about? Well, you know, we've been speaking about sustainable cooling before. Do you remember the Danish initiative that we heard about from the Danish minister and from Inga Andersen? I'm going to show you a, a, a grassroots initiative. We're going to go to Marwa in the Cameroon. It's a really innovative approach led by a, a young entrepreneur called uh, Triomphant Choulon. And he has tried to bring cooling initiatives to help businesses and ordinary people's lives. Je suis Triomphant Tulan, ingénieur en énergie renouvelable, spécialiste du photovoltaïque et thermique euh, et fondateur de Clean Energy Services. À seulement 26 ans, Triomphant Tulan est en passe de révolutionner l'accès à l'énergie dans son pays, le Cameroun. Installé à Maroua, dans l'extrême nord, à un peu plus de 1300 km de Yaoundé, il est affecté par le déficit criard d'énergie et partant de là, des problèmes de conservation des aliments dans des réfrigérateurs. À Marois, 
il n'est pas rare de passer plusieurs jours sans électricité du fait des délestages. On s'est concentré dans une enceinte adiabatique vraiment fermée pour pouvoir euh, euh, conserver pas mal d'aliments qui avaient pour éviter les, les pertes de post-récolte et le faible accès à l'électricité également de la région. Nous avons euh, vraiment poussé à, à, à cela. C'est donc pour résoudre ce problème que Triomphant Tulan a développé une solution plutôt innovante. Un réfrigérateur solaire qui intègre à la fois l'énergie photovoltaïque et thermique, lui permettant de fonctionner 24 heures sur 24 sans l'utilisation de batteries pour le stockage. De quoi produire une température nécessaire pour conserver les aliments, les produits pharmaceutiques et surtout les vaccins sensibles en cette période de COVID-19. On peut également conserver les vaccins. Et une commande nous permet de fixer la température des vaccins entre par exemple 2 et 8 degrés. Et si on est en mode vaccin, que ce soit le jour ou la nuit, on a sans stockage de façon continue une bonne température pour la conservation des vaccins. Et en plus, l'épaisseur d'isolation est réduite et puis il fonctionne 24 heures sur 24 et bien sûr, il fait de matériaux locaux. Un projet porteur dans cette partie du Cameroun qui se heurte rapidement au problème du coût de production. En utilisant les matériaux classiques, un réfrigérateur reviendrait à l'utilisateur final à un montant avoisinant les 600 000 francs CFA, soit 915 euros. Trop cher pour le Camerounais moyen. Le jeune ingénieur a alors l'idée d'utiliser la réalité de son environnement pour en faire un atout. Marois étant situé dans la zone sahélienne, le soleil est une ressource garantie. Il pense alors à utiliser l'énergie solaire pour alimenter sa trouvaille et le matériel local, notamment le bambou, le bois, pour fabriquer la structure. On a remarqué que le liège de bambou était un très très bon isolant qui se rapprochait de, de l'isolant habituel, le polyuréthane ou le polystyrène, avec lequel on fait un alliage pour avoir une très très bonne isolation et puis euh, pouvoir euh, utiliser cette isolation pour pouvoir vraiment faire euh, notre enceinte à réfrigérer ou faire notre bahut de stockage. Ce faisant, les coûts de production sont divisés par deux et le produit final revient à l'utilisateur à 300 000 francs CFA, soit 457 euros. Une fois installé, euh, la seule maintenance à faire, c'est de pouvoir nettoyer juste la surface des panneaux de, de temps en temps. Et notre système, il est facilement utilisable, il est transportable, il est bien réplicable et, 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 et assez simple à, à, à reproduire. Outre le côté conservation, le Bisolar Tech Fridge dégage également assez d'énergie pour pouvoir permettre à ses utilisateurs de recharger via des terminaux adaptés leur téléphone portable ou brancher une radio, une plus-value qui s'apparente à un luxe dans le contexte local. À l'avenir, le jeune prodige camerounais prévoit d'étendre sa solution sous des formes beaucoup plus communautaires. Il envisage notamment de mettre sur pied de grands conteneurs réfrigérés dans lesquels les communautés tout entières pourront enfin accéder aux précieux sésames pour stocker leurs aliments en toute sécurité tout en protégeant l'environnement. Fascinating, isn't it, what you can do with a bit of inspiration and creativity. It was so good hearing Tronfort talking about the way in which he's using local materials then like bomb bamboo, bamboo cork I had never heard of before for its insulating properties and other flexible solutions. Do you remember what we heard from Schneider Electric? We do need to find innovative ways to make sure that renewable energy really gets to the last mile. That's where the innovation is required. In a moment, we're going to look at innovation in finance too. Because in addition to the products, the delivery mechanisms, we also have to ramp up finance, de-risk it, we keep hearing, in order to make sure that the, the really the, the most remote and the most cut off communities in, in, in small island developing states and across Africa and some parts of Asia are brought into the world umbrella and brought, brought into the possibilities of economic development. So are we ready to have that panel discussion now? I'm just going to get a little check from our tech 
gurus because we have a great lineup of panelists to introduce you to who are all going to talk to us about their views on how we can manage to de-risk, come up with new products, crowd in the private sector. What is the real role of financiers in this space when it comes to delivering SDG 7? That is what we still have to crack, as the gentleman from Schneider Electric said to us. So are we ready yet? Not quite yet. We have our panelists, but I don't think we have our moderator yet from Bloomberg Philanthropies. She's going to be looking at, they are all going to be looking at the last hurdles that we have, really, which is how do we bring electricity to the remaining seven, eight hundred million people on this planet who still do not have the ability to grow, to, to be part of the modern economy, to uh, educate themselves, to have access to hospitals and health clinics with round-the-clock electricity. We've really discovered in the midst of this COVID pandemic what kind of problems the lack of electricity can mean in terms of distributing what precious vaccines we have. Some of them are having to be thrown away because of the lack of electricity. If nothing else has brought to the fore the importance of electricity to development to health and to the delivery of a multiplicity of SDGs. This last year and a half of the COVID pandemic has done so. I think we've got our panelists ready, so I'm going to introduce them to you. Um, who should I call in first? Ashvin Dayal is interim CEO of the Global Energy Alliance. Welcome, Ashvin. Uh, he's from the Rockefeller Foundation, but the Global Energy Alliance is like a huge alliance, like Gavi, isn't it? Bringing together different players. And I want you to tell me what you think you can achieve in this kind of a coalition. Um, I think we've also got um, Kevin Kariuki, Vice President of the African Development Bank, obviously doing a huge amount of lifting. Welcome, Mr. Kariuki, in this area, because the, the vast majority of people without electricity on our beloved planet live in Africa, unfortunately. The solutions are there, but we are going to be able to do it. And who else do we have with us? Do we have um, Andrew Hauskowitz from the CD, the Chief Development Officer of the US Development Finance Corporation with us? We do indeed. Hello, Andrew. Thank you for waiting patiently. I think we're simply waiting for our moderator now. So I'm going to hand over, without further ado, to Antha Williams from Bloomberg Philanthropies. Oh, no, I've, I've forgotten to introduce you to Alfonso Rodriguez. I do apologize, Mr. Rodriguez, the Vice Minister of Energy for Savings and Efficiency from the Dominican Republic joins us um, because one of the focuses of this discussion is how to reach small island developing states as well, which have particular problems in trying to get electricity because of their remoteness and because of the, of the small size of the population. So while we're waiting for our moderator to join us from Bloomberg, let me start the moderation, if you don't mind, and forgive me in advance, dear panelists, if I ask you very basic questions. I'd like to ask, start first with Ashwin Dayal on what you think something like this huge alliance that you lead can actually deliver in the, nine, the next nine years in reaching the SDG goal. Well, no, thank you, Anisha, and good morning. It's a, it's a pleasure to be with everyone. Um, look, I think, you know, as, as I heard your introductory remarks, uh, the, the challenge that we have in front of us is we need to end energy poverty um, for the world for all of the reasons that you outlined. But at the same time, we have to do it in a way that is also going to protect the planet. Um, and the fact is that today we have an unprecedented opportunity, given the technologies that are out there, what we lack right now is enough integration of effort. Um, so the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet, as we call it, is really uh, an effort to bring philanthropic organizations together with countries and governments, um, as well as the, the multilateral development banks that, that Kev, Kevin represents and uh, the development finance institutions that Andy works with at the US Development Finance Corporation and a whole other host of technical partners and saying, look, in the same way that Gavi took on this challenge, you know, many decades ago with immunization, we need the same kind of mobilization now. And for the first time, we have not just the technologies, but also the political will, the philanthropic sector really coming together around this challenge. 
and saying, let's put together a coalition that can really align our efforts, can use uh, different types of capital to create the financing solutions that you talk about. And, uh, and you can know, interrupt the there for a moment, Ashwin Dayal. What is the yes. role of philanthropic organizations in all that? Just spell it out for well, us. We're, we're trying to address some of the challenges that are the hard, you know, in the hardest to reach places. And that means that you don't necessarily have extremely commercially fundable projects that can be rolled out quickly. So what, what philanthropy does is a few things. It can pay for the things that other people won't pay for. It'll pay for the upstream work, provide large amounts of grant capital for project development, policy work, technical support. And when you get into financing, you know, you create a lot of these blended financing solutions where you have DFI capital coming together with commercial capital. And what philanthropies can do is de-risk that, can provide support at the base of that capital stack and say, look, this project to reach thousands or hundreds of thousands of people in rural Uganda um, or in, you know, in multiple other countries can be made viable with the private sector involved if there's a certain amount of cushion, there's some viability funding. And there's ways okay. to be innovative. So the philanthropists are taking some of the cost out, as it were, and making exactly. projects more attractive. Absolutely. So now let's get Absolutely. a perspective from the two development finance uh, chiefs we have with us. Um, first, may I uh, ask uh, Kevin Karayuki, what do you see as the nub of the issue in terms of de-risking projects on scale and crowding in the private sector? Thank you very much, uh, Nisha. Um, I think that's a very uh, good question. And, and, the, and the first thing I must say is that I'm sure all the colleagues on this, all the panelists on this will agree with me. The first thing that we must do is to create enabling and legal and regulatory frameworks. I mean, we all acknowledge that regulatory reforms, for example, that result in credible, predictable, and stable regulatory regimes are fundamental attracting private sector investment that would other that would enhance therefore enhance adequacy reliability and security of generation and so on and so forth then so, so could okay. i interrupt you there for a moment mr karaoke why Please. is it so hard then we know that countries which have managed to establish these frameworks have managed to bring in the private sector and got got some kind of lift off why is it so difficult then for countries to, to set up those mechanisms because it, there are political issues here, aren't there, that you have to be dealing with? It, 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 it's, a, it's a number of things, and that brings me to the next uh, thing. Is is actually the lack of capacity on on the part of governments to be able uh, to, to 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 create those uh, enabling environments, and that's why, for example, as a bank, we actually work with what we call upstream work. We provide funding for upstream work to help these countries actually establish those regulatory, legal, uh, and, and, and in, in, in institutional frameworks so that they are able to attract these private investments. Okay, thank you very much. And we shall come back to you to unpack that thought a bit later. Um, but first, let's bring in Andrew Herskovitz now. So, so give us your perspective sitting in the US on what you think the development finance world can bring to the table in order to really expand the envelope of investment. Yeah, so the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation, known as DFC, which is the U.S. government's development finance agency created just about two years ago, has a lot of tools available, including the ability to provide equity to some of these companies that are trying to go into the space of distributed renewable energy, debt, insurance, technical assistance. But really, the challenge that we're facing is that this industry of distributed renewable energy and really trying to reach the last mile is a relatively new industry. So it's not just supporting the technologies that are constantly evolving, which we have been doing and we've seen tremendous progress with the use of solar home systems, but we want to get to that higher level of productive use so that people can operate productive appliances and not just watch television with their solar home systems. So one of the things that DFC has been doing is we've been working very closely with Rockefeller Foundation, with the Shell Foundation, and with others to see how we can de-risk these investments in these types of projects, in these types of companies. We did a call for applications and we got a very robust response for companies all over the world that are going into the space. You have commercially viable technologies, but the problem is operationalizing them. And as Kevin pointed out, it's not just a question, of, you know, it's a question of building out the regulatory environment, but even before you get there, it's a question of thinking differently. Everybody thinks that you either give somebody a solar lantern or sell them a solar home system, or you extend the grid. 
which we all are used to. But the idea of having these distributed networks that can speak to one another is something that is new, not just to the developing world, but to the United States and others as well. So we all collectively are learning about the models that we can develop to really transform the way that we look at the distribution of electricity. Okay, so let's now hear from the Honorable Minister Rodriguez from the Dominican Republic. You've been listening to these inputs, Honorable Minister. Are you satisfied with what you've heard? Do you feel that there is going to be um, progress made rapidly enough for yourself? Well, the problem is that the small developing island have a different situation. We as a states are a small islands and we are not interconnected with another country. So what is our reality? For example, I will put my country, Dominican Republic is on the hurricane path. So we as a country, we have to have our backup system. We have to need our renewable energy in order to comply with our Kyoto Accordance, and we need our coal-fired power plants, and we need natural gas power plants because after a hurricane path, we need the energy to supply after the natural disaster. So when you need that backup plan, turn it off, waiting for a natural disaster, your electricity price goes up because you need like a backup plan of 800 megawatt waiting to be started up when you are waiting for an emergency. Yeah. That's, what, that's why a small island and developing states have an enormous electricity price waiting for an emergency to occur. That's what happened when Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico. That's what happened when Hurricane Maria strike Guadalupe. That's what happened when Hurricane George strike Dominican Republic in 1998. Right now- so You end we, up with an exceptionally expensive system because you've got to shadow what you've got with, with the backup plan. Yes, and that is what is happening right now. We as countries of a small uh, island developing states, if we may make an analysis of what we are contributing with the CO2 emission, all the small, uh, small developing states, we don't contribute with more than 1% of the whole CO2 emission of the world, but we are the most affected states with the whole CO2 emission. Why? Because the global warming affect our beaches, will affect our tourist industry right now, we are having a lot of problems with the sargasso and the tourist industry are affecting our economy. And we are not the ones that are contributing with the global warming. Indeed, and the injustice is considerable, isn't it, on both sides of the equation. Um, I yes. just want to bring in um, Ashwin Dayal now from the mm -hmm. Rockefeller Foundation, who is leading the Global Energy Alliance. I really saw you nodding and, and listening very attentively just now to what. Um, the Honourable Minister was saying. Do you see philanthropy playing a particular part in this particular space with small island developing states? Well, I was really, really listening carefully because I think the Honourable Minister makes an incredibly important point. We often talk about small island developing states as part of the solution to the climate change challenge, but as the Honourable Minister rightly points out, their contribution to carbon emissions is actually negligible. Their challenge is very unique. We need to think about resilient energy systems um, in small island developing nations, because as the minister pointed out, uh, there is a need for different forms of backup uh, power. So absolutely, I think part of helping smaller countries develop the right combination of plans to see how you can bring prices down. And there too, you need concessional capital, you need to see different actors come together. In the case, in the, in the case of the minister, the Inter-American Development Bank should be playing you know, a really powerful role in trying to support the development of the right kind of energy systems. So for us, the Global Energy Alliance certainly hopes to work with a much larger number of small island developing nations to address the very particular challenges that they face. It's not a straightforward uh, equation and the challenges with variable renewables are something we really have to think through. 
Continue this conversation in private, Minister, with uh, Ashwin Bayar. <laughs> so I'm going to throw a question unprompted to, our both to both our development finance chiefs, if I may, to end on a positive note, if I may. And that is, can you outline for us an example of where you think innovative financial structuring, risk de-risking, setting up enabling frameworks, all the different elements you've been talking about has worked and how we can use that as a model for the future. So could I, I'm gonna ask you both to, to, to muse on that, please. And could Andrew Herskovitz go first, and then I will ask Kevin Kariuki. Sure, I'd be happy to. So, so DFC already has invested over $340 million to date in the energy access space. And Power Africa, which is the largest public-private partnership for development in history that the US government leads, has actually helped 120 million people get access to electricity in Africa since it was launched seven years ago. And that's by bringing all of the tools that we've mentioned, including technical assistance, uh, including uh, uh, loan guarantees and DFCs providing loan guarantees in Latin America to, com to companies that are providing some of these solutions. But I think that as we look forward, and I listen to the honorable minister, he doesn't know this, but I spent five years living in the Dominican Republic. And when I was in high school, I was an exchange student there. And the first words I learned in Spanish were no hay agua, no, ni hay luz. And that was because of the, the historical problems of, of electricity in Dominican Republic, and, and they continue to this day. So I think as we look forward to new technologies, the same problems that plague the small island states uh, like Dominican Republic, they affect the United States as well, as we saw with a recent hurricane, when we saw that the, the entire power grid went down in New Orleans. And if we had distributed networks, we could have built in that redundancy. So we're gonna have to continue to look at how these networks, along with new developments in battery technology, are gonna allow us to create almost what are like mesh networks, where these networks talk to one another so everyone is not without power. Okay, thank you. And um, Kevin Kariuki, what, what, what are your thoughts on an innovative model that we have managed to develop that you think- Thank you very much. Uh, for, 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 for me, I would say that uh, at the African Development Bank, we have established what we call the Sustainable Energy for Africa, or CEFA. This is a blended facility that we manage, and it provides catalytic finance to unlock private sector investments in renewable energies. And we provide funding for technical assistance, consumer finance, and so on and so forth. Now here, uh, and when it is fully rolled out, we expect that it will result in providing energy access to some 45 million people. In this regard, and to answer your question very specifically, uh, as part of the, our program, we have what we call the Green Mini Grid uh, development, uh, Market Development Program, which we funded. And as a result of this, there is the, what we call the Moyi Power Project in uh, DRC, being developed by Gridworks of UK, that will provide electricity access to some 500 million people, sorry, 500,000 people in Eastern DRC. The other facility I would want to mention, which is bank uh, established, is what we call Facility for Energy Inclusion. This is uh, where we use financial intermediaries. And this is a $500 million investment platform which is organized on two, uh, on two, on two funds, one for off-grid and one for on-grid, and that which will provide uh, uh, flexible debt products, including local currency, to emerging uh, businesses model, business models uh, in uh, small-scale renewables. When fully deployed, FEI is actually expected to provide energy access to some 12.5 million people. Mark you, and this is very important, it is projected by the International Energy Agency by 2030, 50% of new connections will be from distributed renewable energy. So as uh, Andrew just mentioned- I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Mr. Karaoke. I just want to ask you something very, very briefly. Yes, we please. need um, money on a scale which is unimaginable yet. You know, we're talking about billions going into trillions, millions going into billions. Where are we going to get it from? And I, I wonder if both um, you and Andrew Herskovitz can give us a quick response to that before I come to the Honorable Minister. Yeah, I, I will say one thing. Uh, let me start here. Uh, I am a firm believer that to the extent that we are able to structure projects correctly and bring forth to the market, money will never be a problem. 
there is trillions of money out there. There are sovereign wealth funds. There are the, uh, DFIs like a DFC and, 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 and a multilaterals like ourselves. But what is actually important is being able to structure and bring forth uh, well-structured projects in enabling environments. And here, allow me, uh, uh, Nisha, to just provide an analogy I've always tried to, to, to cite, that like we say in, in, in electricity, that current follows the path of least resistance in Ohm's law, capital two follows the path of least resistance. Let us create enabling environments. Okay, I hear you, Kevin Perry. Are you that optimistic, Andrew Heskovitz? Because, I mean, the wall of money has been there forever. There's, but we no, there's no shortage of money available that wants to invest in this space. There's no shortage of money that wants to invest in this space. And the key is, is how can the public sector, working with philanthropy, make sure that the investments are de-risked enough? And it's not just, and that includes building the capacity making sure people understand the technologies, that people are willing to take on the technologies, that governments are willing. And you also have to worry a little bit about the entrenched interest because every time you add a distributed uh, renewable, uh, distributed network, in some ways that affects sort of what has been the status quo of distribution companies. So you have to figure out how to make sure that everybody understands what this transition is going to look like and that, that there are options for people so they're not adversely affected. So you have to get the buy-in from everyone in the country to make this work. Okay, so I'm going to now go return to the Honourable Minister who's been listening to both of you. Um, the Dominican Republic has um, put out a, a very bold and ambitious energy compact, but you need money to help you deliver that and partners. Are you feeling confident that you're going to be able to attract that? Yes, right now we have delivered a power purchase agreement contract with sovereign warranty and we have a list of investments. What we are seeing is that at the end, if we open the window and we, let's say, allow more than 30% of renewable energy entering the interconnected system, we are going to have technical issues with renewable energy in the interconnected system because we are not as big system. And that is where the technology is not able yet to have batteries working at an accessible price. And one thing right now, we have the biggest solar uh, photovoltaic uh, panel system right now. We have a 100 uh, uh, megawatt system in Dominican Republic, and we have a cloud going over, and we have a, uh, like a power shortage right in the system because our system right now is 3.2 gigawatt peak. And when you take out the 5% in just two seconds, you have a disturbance. And that is something that is bringing problems. So if we have like the 30%, let's say one gigawatt, and in, in one storm, you have one gigawatt out in, let's say 10 minutes, you are having a technical issue. And that is something that we are facing. And we say, okay, we can we cannot go further than 30% of renewable energy. We wish, because we don't have oil under our ground, we wish that we can go 100% renewable, but technically right now it's not possible and we are not looking a solution. But everybody is speaking of batteries. We are now looking at Tesla offer in a system uh, they are offering, but only 16 megawatt of 24 hour fully renewable, but no larger scale. And that is something that we are uh, watching. Everybody's saying we have the money, we can invest, uh, but everybody is offering only eight hours of solar, eight hours of, of wind. Nobody is offering 24 hour of renewable energy. The only 24 hour of renewable energy is thermal solar power plant like Andasol in Spain, but the nubosity, uh, the cloudy uh, sky here at the Caribbean uh, does not allow those, uh, those technologies. So that's a problem for the small island developing states. 
That's that was a very, problem. very interesting answer. Thank you very much, Honourable Minister, mm -hmm. with all the nuances involved. I'm going to give Ashwin Dayal a brief final word, really. How do we mobilise on scale? Trillions of dollars, allegedly waiting out there wanting to invest. Well, thank you. And again, I mean, I think this is why we call it the energy transition and we need to have bespoke solutions for different countries. Look, it, it comes back to what Andrew and Kevin were saying. There's a lot of money out there. I think what we need is just a much more committed effort to tie the dots together, sort of defragment our efforts and actually pool resources, capacities, etc. Philanthropies can do a small part, but it can be catalytic. And I think building a large global energy alliance to really look at country by country what we can achieve together in a way that disrupts uh, how we've been working is really the only way that we can, I think, overcome the challenge of, of not seeing capital flowing into the parts of sort of least resistance, as, as Kevin described. Yes, that was a lo very lovely uh, analogy there. I'm going to say a huge thank you to all our panelists now. Ashwin Bayal from the Rockefeller Foundation, who's putting together this Global Energy Alliance. Kevin Karioki, Vice President of the African Development Bank. Andrew Herskovitz, Chief Development Officer of the US Development Finance Corporation, and the Honorable Minister from the Dominican Republic, Alfonso Rodriguez. It's been a really meaty discussion. Goodbye. And that just about brings day two of our Energy Action Days to a close, I'm going to hand back now to our host, Dabin Lola Ogun BE, for her reflections on how the last couple of days have gone. Dabin Lola. Thank you, Nisha. What a privilege it has been to be with you all over the last two days. Following the impressive commitments of yesterday, today's announcements and the energy compacts again show our pathway from ambition to action. We have seen a rich discussion today covering the full scope of the energy challenge we face. From administrative power, we heard a strong call for expanding access to electricity to advance opportunities for women and girls. The World Bank VP stressed the need to significantly scale up financing through a clean energy offer that prioritizes both electrification and clean cooking. UNEP Executive Secretary built on this point by reiter reiterating the need for equity. The Nigerian Minister of State for Environment put in stark terms the global emergency on energy access, reminding us that there cannot be net zero by 2050 without SDG 7 by 2030. My fellow co-chair, UNDP Administrator, discussed these challenges and also previewed the ambition that UNDP will announce tomorrow, a huge commitment to bring energy access to almost half a billion people. The catalytic finance promise of the Alliance of Rural Electrification will really lead the way. It is also great to see the private sector align on the need to merge the energy and climate agendas with several commitments to deploy large scale renewables and provide energy access. The Commonwealth Secretary General highlighted the key role women can play in driving the energy transition, both as innovators and also recipients as we address the clean cooking challenge. And finally, from our last panel, we have heard about the importance of financing for energy access in developing countries and the SIDS. Ultimately, as we are reminded by today's Youth on Voice, we have everything to play for. The faith of humanity lies in our hands. We look forward to seeing you all tomorrow morning for the Secretary General's opening of the High Level Dialogue on Energy. Thank you all, and thank you especially to Nisha. Back to you. Thank you so very much, Dog Dami Lola, who is the co-chair of tomorrow's high-level dialogue on energy, together with Achim Steiner of the UNDP. Do join us again. It starts at 09.30 uh, Eastern Standard Time, New York time. 
tomorrow. You can follow it on our platform right now or on UNTV, of course, as you would expect. We have an impressive lineup for you. Uh, opening remarks from the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres. We're also joined by Abdullah Shahid, President of the 17th session of the General Assembly. We have a mega private sector leader to get us going, Francesco Starace, the CEO of NL Group, and also at the other end of the scale from Kenya, a young female entrepreneur working in the energy space, Chebet Lesan, who I had the pleasure of meeting yesterday and who will be speaking to all of us. Our platform, I'm sure you will be glad to know, is going to be open for several months more. You can visit it at your leisure to check on our on-demand video tab. You can see how the energy compacts come rolling in and keep make, make sure that we, we stay on our toes, will you? Um, one, one of the things that I find, found very in, inspiring, really, in the last couple of days, that we, we've received some great comments. And thank you for, for feeding into the conversation. I'm, uh, I'm going to just give you a couple of them. Uh, we've, we've got somebody saying, with a, a lot of passion, I feel innovation is the way forward in achieving SDG 7 and will get us there. And uh, somebody else saying women are driving the transition in renewable energy, picking up, I think, on that point from Baroness Scotland of the Commonwealth. Um, so it leaves uh, it to me simply to say a big thank you to the amazing High Level Dialogue for Energy Secretariat that's made this event possible. Thank you to all our special guests for taking time out of their busy schedules to join us and add their commitment to SDG 7. And of course, the biggest thank you of all to all of you for joining us today. And I hope you'll be back with us again tomorrow. From me, Nisha Pillay. Goodbye for now. <laughs>